Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We are delighted that you could join us this afternoon for our foundations and funders equity discussion with some incredible people on a very important topic today called Crisis Calling for Foundations, Democracy, Access, Equity, ROI, and Undeniable Realities. We are uh, delighted that you could join us. We have a number of different equity teams and uh, we meet monthly uh, to really look at some of the, the tough issues and specific ways we might solve those issues. In addition to the equity teams, we work very closely with first gen to college and underrepresented students. We connect them to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs through our campus collaboratives, through our um, annual conference, which was virtual this year, will likely be virtual this coming year. Um, but we are very dedicated to closing the equity gap by mining this incredible talent that, that comes from um, people who, who really can be connected to all kinds of resources, but whose backgrounds don't come with that and colleges and universities may not be able to help them to the extent that, that our networks can. So we're delighted you're here. And I would like to introduce um, Erica Seth Davies, who is the founder of the Racial Equity Asset Lab. She's also the founder of the Baltimore Community Foundation, but the REAL Real works at the intersection of racial equity and impact investing to shift capital to improve the material conditions of black communities for the betterment of all. A thoughtful and strategic leader, Erica works with a network of people dedicated to advancing policy, challenging the narrative, and implementing strategies for equitable outcomes in Black and other communities of color. With experience in nonprofit and philanthropic institutions, she is dedicated to advancing diversity, inclusion, and equity through policy and practice. So for these reasons, she is the perfect person to lead us on this critical topic. Erica, welcome. Thank you so much, Carol. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I will say I did not found the, the Baltimore Community Foundation. It was around a little bit longer, <laughs> but, but I was the chief of staff there before uh, moving into to some current roles. So, but thank you so much um, for um, such a lovely introduction. Um, I am really happy to be here um, and um, supporting this mission of uh, leveraging networks uh, for change, for opportunity and change. Um, and this is a conversation that is particularly um, near to the, the work that I've done um, over the last 10 years um, that has been focused on uh, advancing uh, racial equity and challenging um, the ways in which foundations are managing their assets. So looking at who has the opportunity to access um, uh, investment opportunities or investments um, of endowments, but also what those underlying endowments are, are being invested in um, such that those investments might actually be making their philanthropy necessary. Um, and so if quite frankly, 95% of the assets of a foundation are at work and 5% um, is, is for grant making, where's where's the the majority um is going into um really does matter and so um that's been the the intersection for me in terms of of my work and really um excited to dig into a conversation with these other leaders about where they come into this conversation about equity as well um it's it's conversations about networks about pipeline um about systems um and um the ways in which all these things come together for for change so i will do a quick round of introduction um, and then ask um, everyone to, to just give us about two minutes about what their, their work is focused on. Um, and so we have with us um, today uh, uh, Janet Tran, Dr. Janet Tran, who's the Director of Learning and Leadership at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library Foundation and Institute. Thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Thane Kreiner, um, who is a board member with Conservation X Labs. Um, a Bernie Milano, who's a retired former president of the KPMG Foundation and the PhD Project, and Profil Shah, who is a board member with Social Venture Circle. Um, so let's start with, with you, Janet. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about your, your work and your organization? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, come to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute, uh, having previously served in the, my past life as a teacher leader in South Central Los Angeles and downtown LA for about a decade. And um, you know, as a daughter of refugees whose parents maybe have a, a second grade education combined, I really look to um, foundations as a space to really think about education as that great equalizer. 
So I came on board to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation to uh, help start up our nonpartisan civic learning portfolios. And most of our investments are in what we call these citizen leaders. Uh, we have a real belief and optimism in young people to, to make the changes and uh, you know, take the actions that need to, to happen um, because uh, we, we look to the generation that we are working with right now and we're a little steeped in our ways, uh, but uh, serving really and giving scholarships. We give over $1 million in scholarships to students who, who uh, show character, who are uh, people of service, who are um, not just the 4.99 students, but people who are interested in serving and being civically engaged. And that's the work that uh, I operate out of the Center for Civics Education and Opportunity. Great, thank you so much. Um, Profil, let's, let's hear a little bit about your work with the uh, Social Venture Circle. Thank you. Uh, my background is in biotech and pharma. I spent my whole life there. I retired about 10 years ago and helping out the startup companies focused on social impact and most of the companies started by women. Uh, social Venture Circle uh, is among very a number of organizations and nonprofit entities I help uh, advise. Uh, social Venture Circle itself is uh, focused on having a really a gathering place for businesses as well as uh, people who are interested in, in social impact. Perfect, thanks so much. Thane, you're up next. Thanks, Erica. Uh, so I actually, I guess I'm in my third or fourth vocational uh, phase, depending on how you look at it. I was trained as a neuroscientist at uh, Stanford. And while I was doing my postdoc at UC Berkeley, decided to go back and get an MBA at Stanford so that I could be more on the business side of biotech uh, and get products um, and services to market that actually improve people's lives. Um, so I spent the next 17 years building and starting life sciences companies, uh, CEO of four startup companies. And I left that in 2010 to lead what later became Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, which accelerates social enterprises serving the poor and protecting the planet. So very much a social justice mission in areas like sustainable food systems, healthcare, women's economic empowerment, safe drinking water, clean energy, et cetera. And scale that up, we um, accelerated literally a thousand social enterprises that raised about $500 million after going through our accelerator programs and collectively improved, transformed, or saved the lives of 450 million people living in poverty um, all around the planet. Over the last eight months, I've been devoting my time and energy to several different racial justice initiatives, uh, co-founding the Black Corporate Board Readiness Program, which I'll talk about a little bit more, working with bu uh, business school classmates from class of 94 Stanford to build and launch a racial equity playbook uh, to help organizations um, become anti-racist in their um, words and deeds, and then counteracting voter suppression in voter suppression states. So, the Black Corporate Board Readiness Program uh, has been uh, a shared journey with uh, my co-founder, Dennis Lanham, who leads the Silicon Valley Executive Center uh, and is a good friend. And we brought together um, an amazing community of facilitators, mentors, and advisors. The first cohort's gonna launch a week from today um, on February 4th with 28 participants who are already talented, already qualified for board service. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. The second cohort will launch on June 3rd. And thank you all for being here and um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, and Bernie, tell us a little bit about your, your former and your current work you see. Well, thank you, Erica. I uh, retired uh, almost 367 days ago after 58 and a half years with KPMG. Uh, and the KPMG Foundation really believes in strategic and systemic efforts uh, aimed at a pipeline. So for instance, we have a program that's pre-K through three, which primarily, and it's now global, but primarily reads the children in, in the, uh, the underserved schools in the inner cities. Uh, leaving them with a set of books with their name in the inside cover so that, uh, as we've been told by the teachers frequently, these are the only books these children have ever owned and believe that belong to them. And that's been really wonderful, uh, very hard to, to measure impact, but really wonderful. And then we've partnered with Junior Achievement on a middle school program called uh, Finance Park, uh, teaching children in the grades four through six or seven or eight about 
uh, financial literacy and uh, it actually has a hands-on program at the end where they they pretend they have certain roles they, they might be the mother they might be the father they might be a doctor uh, but uh, taking all the learnings they've had during that period of time uh, leading up to uh, functioning as if they're actually part of a community and part of the society and then we've now taken a high school program called NAF, National Academies Foundation, which exists for about 30 some years, started by Sandy Weil a number of years ago, but they have created career academies, again, primarily in inner city high schools, where a very small percentage of the students normally go to college. But now that students are, are accessing these career academies, and there are five different types, 85% of the students going through those academies end up entering college. So again, it's, it's the pipeline. And a lot of stuff at, at the uh, uh, undergraduate level, uh, working with HBCUs and tribal colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. But the, uh, the capstone is a program called the PhD Project, which we've been at it now since 1994, basically trying to identify and inspire and encourage uh, African, Hispanic, and Native Americans to leave their current careers, to get a doctorate in, in one of the business, five business disciplines, and become professors because there are so many programs that are driving students as freshmen to, to college, especially as, as uh, Carol pointed out, first generation college students, many of them being um, underrepresented groups. But they get there and the environment is one that says, I'm not sure I belong here because frequently the faculty is all white, um, administrators are white, president's white. So we really believe that um, you have to see it to be it. So if we can get more quote unquote, uh, faculty of color, uh, they will attract more students of color, which means then that corporations can finally get the diversity they've been looking for all of these decades because if the business schools aren't producing them, then there's no way you can, you can hire them. So that's our capstone and we're, uh, we're proud of our results. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. So we're in this moment, right? I mentioned all these crises that are coming together, um, this confluence of a lot of decision-making and choices um, over decades, if not centuries, that have, have brought us to these, these challenges. So whether it's climate change, you know, threats to, to democracy, um, again, deep uh, inequality um, in our in our country. We're seeing the fractures um, that are, are are taking place now, um, and so these are all long term plays that everybody is making uh, for for change. Um, and uh, so, I guess the question is based on all these different angles um, from which you've come. And I'm actually completely fascinated by sort of the origin stories that are happening <laughs> um, here. So from neuroscience to uh, biotech, teaching, um, accounting for like, it's it's amazing um, they, that have brought us to this one to this conversation and then um, each of you as, as individuals to your, your respective points of view now. Um, but if you think about kind of where you sit um, uh, at this point, what, what are those those interventions that um, you think are actually going to shift, um, and and I guess in a in a in a significant way, right? Like the ultimate outcomes um, as we're at this moment of of, of crisis, if you will. Um, and so you know, there's a lot of investment in individuals, but are there things that could be happening in the system as well? Um, from where you sit um, that, that could be making some, some additional changes, whether it's related to your work or what you're seeing as part of your work. Well, if it's, uh, if it's open season, I'll start. By all means, jump right in. <laughs> well, you know, I, we're a firm believer that things have got to be strategic and they have to be systemic. Mm -hmm. You talked about long range play, plays and it's only the long range plays that really are going to make a difference. And when I talked about the PhD project and the opportunity to attract students of color into uh, business schools and therefore into the corporate world, uh, because there's, there's just not, there's not a critical mass in most organizations of people of color. And if we can change that, then there'll be more people moving into uh, upper level positions. But to me, one of the really powerful outcomes of what we're trying to do with uh, diversifying faculty is changing the attitudes and the stereotypes that white students are carrying with them when they enter college. 
the K-12 system in this country has never been more segregated than it is today. It's all about zip codes. And those same students then go to a university and the predominant, if they're going to a traditionally white institution, obviously predominantly white and the faculty are white and the dean's white and the president's white. And they're carrying then, they're carrying these attitudes they have and these, these stereotypes with them into the corporate workplace. So that's why corporations have to spend zillions of dollars on diversity training, diversity awareness, learning to work with people. And you know, it's because of the, the product, the product that they're buying from the universities is so poorly produced. But just think if, if, if you have a, a faculty, an Hispanic member, a faculty member or Native American faculty member, a black faculty member, how the attitudes and the stereotypes being carried by the white students are likely to be, if not changed, challenged. So that, so that the respect they have for people who are different from them will be very, very different by the time they finish. And the more of that we have, then the more uh, impact it, it will have. And, and then movements toward racial justice and people understanding the need for racial justice and people needing the, the need to understand that, um, you know, there's one race, there's a human race. There might be different colorations, but there's, it's a human race and everybody should have the same opportunities. Thank you so much. Dane. Well, yeah, so I hope I can, I cannot pass up an opportunity uh, to, to be an evangelist for civic learning and civic engagement as, um, as I believe a fundamental root solution for almost all of the problems that uh, exist. And uh, I remember speaking with the National Association of Environmental Educators. And at the time the report had come out that, you know, there was 12 years to solve this problem. And I posit that, you know, well then we have six years uh, to solve democracy because that needs to be resolved prior to resolving any of the sort of larger issues. And, you know, the average person does not have the bandwidth um, to deal with the sort of incredible, uh, the scale of challenges that, uh, you know, Erica, that you've talked about. It's, uh, it's very like we, we knew there were cracks in the infrastructure, but when we peeled the wallpaper back, it was actually just these gaping holes and we had no idea, or at least many of us didn't have any idea, um, the severity of it. So, when you really think about any of the challenges um, from when I was teaching in South Central Los Angeles and the fact that there weren't permanent teachers in every classroom, you know, we had our students learning the wrong things. They should have been writing letters to their school board, um, accessing their civic power uh, to say, I am not receiving the same type of education that is purported to be available to all students in the United States. And similarly, looking at problems of racial justice to, um, again, to climate change, these problems uh, are resolved by people who receive a high quality uh, civic uh, education at their schools. And that's not something that's happening right now. At the, very, uh, at the very core, there's been an incredible divestment in civic learning and social studies education. Uh, from the time of Sputnik, there was this real uh, intense investment in STEM. So really, um, if we think about what the foundations did, there, there was a feeling of uh, we'll, we'll revive or we'll invest uh, post the 2016 election, seeing the signs of divisiveness. But those investments, if you look more closely, really went into C4 activities, electoral activities. And we really ought not to conflate um, voting with civic engagement and, and civic life. It is one factor. I, I would argue it's the floor of what we need to do to be a good citizen. But it is not, it is by far not a, an indicator of uh, the end all be all. You know, it is often very transactional for a lot of our first generation and a lot of our young people who really feel like people come to them when it's time to get their vote. But ultimately, do these elected officials, you know, actually pay and heed their, their voice after they receive the vote? So I think a more long game, um, and I'll just end, you know, President Reagan called in his farewell address for an informed patriotism and uh, recently featured in John Meacham's uh, podcast as well as, as required reading through the lens of history. It's, a, it's very different than just, I love my country. Informed patriotism is critical. It's um, thoughtful. It means that you are part of the solution and not just uh, you know, carrying and waving a flag. And he very much differentiated that feeling of national pride 
versus the person who can contribute and uh, be part of the solution when it comes to these grand, great problems that we, we face in front of us at this very moment. So if I could uh, jump in there, one of the things I would say is I, I think to transform um, these systems, we need integrated strategies. And there's, I think, no question. I, I think the gaping holes in the infrastructure that you referred to, Janet, are exactly right, that racism pervades every single one of our systems, whether that's education, health, criminal justice, voting, law enforcement, food, um, and particularly uh, the capital systems. One of the reasons that we decided to start with a um, black corporate board readiness program, by no means do we believe that it's um, the only solution or an entire solution is that to change systems, we need to change governance of those systems. And as Darren Walker says, uh, we need to move on corporate boards from tokenism to transformation. So building authentic diversity on corporate boards where a lot of wealth generation takes event uh, takes place is one of the critical levers for transforming these systems. But we also need to drive um, changes in the organizations throughout at every single level so that they're inclusive. I'm reminded of Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, which came out in 2015, the same year as the Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the things that's remarkable about both of those documents is that they realize and acknowledge for the first time that everything is interconnected. So when we talk about poverty and climate change, Pope Francis talks about the intimate nature of those, but at the heart of it, poverty is really an issue about racism all over the world, in the United States particularly. And we see that manifested um, through all of these systems. So I'm a strong believer that um, we need to partner and we need to partner vigorously who, with people who have shared passions for transformation of these systems and people do what they're best at. There's not gonna be a single organization that can affect systems level change. So foundations should be thinking about how to get the right group of partners together to address different elements of different systems and the systems and their interconnections. Thanks so much. Okay, I'll add my two cents. I think uh, uh, Bernie and Janet and Ken uh, certainly did talk about what needs to be done on a systemic change. It takes a long time. Uh, so I grew up in a small village in India with no running water or electricity uh, right after the independence. Uh, uh, Nehru was the first prime minister. India was, you know, really poor country back then, still is. Uh, but he came out and says, we're going to have some of the top universities in the world back then. You know, this was back 1950s. And everyone was laughing. You know, you, know, you can't even get these simple things done. How are you going to have the best universities? And... He just said, you know, this is our mandate, we're gonna do it. And that was the genesis for Indian Institute of Technology, some of the best universities in the world, IIT. The reason I brought up this example uh, is that's what we need to do here with racism. Uh, I just cannot believe, you know, having grown up uh, where I did, where caste system was, was predominant to see the somewhat similar situation here with uh, blacks and whites, we need a mandate. That would be my first thing, like, okay, we are going to make sure that this is what's gonna happen in a generation. Uh, you know, it would be nice to say in a year, but that's not gonna happen. In a generation, we will not have this discussion. So that'll be my recommendation. Thanks so much. Um, and actually that's a, a great jumping off point for what then are some of those those challenges that we do have to, to navigate on the way. So we are coming out of a very divisive moment in, in US um, politics and, and just history in general, right? So the, the country and people, I mean, we hear this over and over again, it's divided. Yes, it is. Um, and you know, there are calls for accountability, there are calls for uh, policy change, uh, but how do you, um, how do you move this along at this moment where it's so stark, right? Like where there is um, just, it's almost battlegrounds, battle, battle lines have been drawn on, on some of these issues. So um, Janet, I'd actually like to start with you because you've been talking about, you know, civic engagement. 
um, you know, I, I'm sure people, they, they believe themselves to be civically engaged, right, to your point, like with voting, um, and, and then that was even challenged. Um, and so how, how do we kind of start to push past this moment, not by ignoring it, but at the very least kind of dealing with and, and starting to, to move forward so that there is um, the opportunity for change and is there a role to play for um, um, for for foundations, you know, who tend to try to stay in the middle, stay neutral um, on on a lot of these these topics and these issues? Right. I think um, you know I really appreciate the question because I think if uh, if we've ever seen red lines that we personally don't want to cross, it's it's during this time. Uh, but but I'd also posit that um, you know uh, we've had as divisive moments in American history, certainly, you know, 180,000 Americans died on American soil. We, we don't want to go back to those times. Uh, I think what's really challenging about our radicalization and polarization is that the real, the research shows that people who leave things like the Klan or cults, it is, um, they leave it because there is a better option. It's a real simple story that there's someone else who's willing to accept them. I think of um, Megan Phelps Roper's uh, sort of uh, telling of how she left the Westboro Baptist Church, a, a really vital beliefs in an organization that uh, has, you know, done, has purported some vile views. And she did it at the grace of people who she had said horrible things about, you know, to uh, an Orthodox Jewish gentleman who she had said he should bake in an oven. She held those signs at funerals. And grace is not something you deserve. It's something that is given. And unfortunately, uh, in a struggle, it often does fall upon uh, the oppressed to, to carry that burden of giving grace. And I'm not in any way saying anyone owes and should do that or should run out. But I'm saying that we do know a lot of the solutions is you meet people, you bridge across difference, you realize that those views that you've held are not, a, a, there's so much dissonance in your brain, there's no way to continue living the life you've led, believing the things you believed. Something that we do at the Reagan Institute is we have a program called Leadership in the American Presidency. And it's an investment in young people to uh, come together. Uh, they are university students uh, from east, west, left, and right. We work really hard with a lot of our partners to uh, ensure that we have students who are left of center. Uh, and we get pretty much a 50-50 almost every single cohort. And why this is so important is because most programs at this point, especially in Washington, DC, there's a litmus test. It's like, oh, you work for a Republican, get out. You're, you're not on our team. You work for a Democrat, no can do. And the reality is I think there's so many other facets of our identity. So we bring them together and they learn leadership through the lens of the American presidency, a pretty controversial topic once we started launching the program, but it's either the worst time to do it or the best time. And we are eternal optimists. So we said, this is the best time. And we bring students from small liberal arts colleges to Benedictine colleges to you know UC Berkeley, uh, we have an alum here. And uh, they are able through a very curated um, personal and presidential leadership journey to start thinking about where their values came from, whether they're inherited. Um, we challenge them not to change their minds, but we challenge them to change their minds about one another. Because the moment we have this otherness factor and we start dehumanizing, it is impossible to get to a point where uh, we can resolve problems because again, speaking of grace and of righteousness, if you are righteous and always right, there's no reason to hear from the other side. So once we have these students who, you know, like they say things, that, I mean, they're absolutely hilarious. They're, you know, like, I don't know how I'm going to tell my mom that I'm best friends with a Republican. Um, I've never, you know, to be honest, I've never met a liberal before. These are, you know, statements from students who, they're learning leadership, but the subtext is we're also inoculating them to the concept of leadership and collaboration across difference, um, that this person is not their enemy. This work has, is hard. There's, has, I've not found a way to scale it yet. Um, it requires difficult conversations, something that has been removed entirely from the curriculum from K through 12. Teachers don't have cover or training or background in how to facilitate these conversations. So I think there needs to be more of this um, in terms of foundations, investing in coalitions of difference, uh, investing in, you know, you, some, some of you folks spoke about boards and certainly staff as well. But when we think about diversity, racial diversity, 
clearly has a lot of data that foundations have got a long way to go, even after, you know, the philanthropy. So why hashtag two years later, findings are even worse. So we, we know we, we need to do a better job. I think we also need to look at diversity of life experiences. It, it is stunning in some of the spaces. I'm, I am not sure if um, some of the individuals have ever experienced poverty and what it is like to cry over, you know, paper towels being ruined because we won't be able to buy them any longer. Or, you know, there, there's some foundations who are definitely walking the walk, but for the most part, um, you know, there's some choices that are, are very, um, challenging in light of poverty. And then finally, I think di diversity of political thought, which is really, um, really tough in, in this, this day and age because of the polarization. But ultimately we have, um, you know, 72 million plus Americans who uh, did not vote for this current president. And to bring them back into the fold is, um, is part of the American challenge and promise. And we need to bring people who can explain why they feel that way, which is, um, you know, missing from the foundation space that is, uh, is a little left of center for the most part. And I say that not because uh, we're the Reagan Foundation and, you know, this is, you know, some right wing propaganda. But I say that because um, I think when we don't have voices at the table, there's assumptions as to why those beliefs came to play. And I really do believe uh, that once we understand that this person has a view about uh, social services because of their life experience, it might change our view about their uh, motivations as well. So really hopeful that, you know, racial diversity, a diversity of life experiences and diversity of political thought are sort of at least three anchors that we look at when we think about staffing our foundations to ensure we, we represent uh, this incredibly diverse fabric of, um, of American people that we, we say we are serving and, and the need now is stronger than ever. Thank you. So um, Carol had posted in the in the chat this um, this diversity ink by Pamela Newkirk documents a billion spent on diversity haven't moved the needle for women or people of color in the last three decades. Um, and so I'm going to direct this question to, to Bernie and Thane who are doing these pipeline um, uh, uh, initiatives projects um, that are trying to change um, not just the representation um, at one and these all like these these white spaces let's let's say. Um, part of that has to do with, you know, have the conditions change, right? So, you know, when we talk about diversity and representation, that's usually a, a visual and that's everyone, right? Like that's just a mix of, of people and perspectives and such. But then how do you change the conditions so that those, so that the voices that have historically been marginalized, that, um, you know, those biases, Bernie, that you were talking about that dominate these spaces to the point where they just isolate and crowd people out where they're just like, you know, what, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go do something else or, or be someplace else. How do you um, use the work that you're doing to actually start to shift those, that, that culture, those, um, those spaces so that they are actually inclusive where people's voice matters, where that, that diversity is actually valued and it's demonstrated in the ways that they, they shift to meet the needs of everyone um, in the space. Either one of you can. <laughs> well, let me jump in and just say that um, the Black Corporate Board Readiness Program is not a pipeline building program. That, that's something that um, we were very, very intentional about. And I'll put the link in there if people want to look at it. There are plenty of qualified, talented Black executives who are perfectly capable of serving on public and private corporate boards. There is not a pipeline issue. The issue is networks. The issue is that people select people that they know and their communities tend to be, sorry to say it, cause I'm one now, I'll be 60 this year, but old white guys who golf together, I don't golf. Um, but that's how people pick their board members. And, and I've heard this about how people hire also, it's like, it's much easier to do it based on referrals. If we do it based on referrals, we can get someone on board quickly and we trust them and we pay referral bonuses. All that does is weed out the diversity. And that was one of the things that we built into this racial equity playbook that my classmates 
Knights and I at Stanford put together is stop using referral bo bonuses and insist on a diverse slate of candidates for every single position. If it takes you longer, it will pay off. It will pay off in better business outcomes and it will pay off in racial justice. So, you know, my soapbox is we have concentrated existing talent and we are helping them get ready and what we're helping them get ready for. And this is another you know, topic that raises some, some real um, consternation is, is why do black people, why do women, why do Latinx people need to get ready for boards and, and white people don't. And the truth is that white people should, but they don't, right? And that's why we've had so many issues of corporate malfeasance over the last several decades. Nobody was ever too good at governance, nobody. No offense, Janet, but nobody was ever too good at governance. So everybody should be learning if they're serving in a governance capacity. What we're doing is helping people understand what's the difference in a governing board versus a C-suite, helping them understand what their value proposition is, and then helping them, to your question, Erica, prepare for the reality of being Black on a board. Dennis and I talked to literally 50 black corporate directors over the last six to eight months and every single one of them experienced explicit or implicit racism on public and private boards. Now that's not a shock to people who are brown and black, but it is the truth. And it's something that white people need to hear, they need to understand and they need to make space at the table and they need to make space in their hearts to understand their own privilege and their own need to change so that people are really welcome at their tables. Thank you. You know, I, uh, I think about the, uh, when I ran recruiting for our firm, uh, all the corporations had a, a ready uh, excuse on, as to why they weren't uh, diverse and it's because they couldn't find any. I mean, you, you could hear that ringing through every meeting we went to. You know, we value diversity, we believe in diversity, we know that businesses will run better if there's more diversity at the table when decisions are being made, but gee, you know, we just can't find any. And that stopped the conversation. So my pushback always was, well, you know, if it's a really business concern, it's a, if it's a business problem, is that the way you treat all your business problems by walking away from them? Do something about it, you know, take, have the courage to go forward and do something that perhaps hadn't been done before, which is what we did with the PhD project. But they, and Thane had mentioned before about collaborations. There's, there's no way you can attack uh, any, any major issue by yourself. I mean, if there's one thing I, you know, my, my main involvement has been with corporate foundations as opposed to the privates. Uh, and the corporate foundations invariably wanna have signature programs and they'll run that signature program to the ground. And, and, and not take any of their funding and put it into other programs that perhaps could be uh, a corollary to what they're doing. It could help fill the gap in, in what they're doing. It could round out everything that needs to be done to, to attack that area. Uh, but, but it's really difficult for them to do that because they have to report to their bosses that our foundation did this and we got all this credit for that and then we got all this PR from that and, and it's all you know, our names associated with it, where it wouldn't be if they were collaborating with, uh, with other organizations. So collaboration to me, I'm, some people say it's my middle name. I just, I absolutely, as soon as I hear about an organization, the first thing I think of is who can I put them in touch with that can help them uh, solve, you know, at attack their mission and attack the other organization's mission with, with neither party feeling as if they are likely to be cannibalized in their, in their funding stream, because that's certainly what a lot of nonprofits uh, unfortunately worry about. And then Janet talked about education. Uh, maybe I'm being naive, but I, I was telling Erica earlier that our little church, we have a little church here in New Jersey and it's predominantly, let's say exclusively white. And we decided after the, the, the George Floyd issues this summer to start a social justice reading group and we started reading books, you know, how to be an anti-racist, uh, the color of law, uh, the broken heart of America. We're now reading cast and, and Proffel, you mentioned cast and, 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 to, and to think about, and you said it, to think about what in the United States, our caste system is there. It, it's the blacks and it's others in the, in the medium caste and then quote the top caste being the, the white people. But if, 
the attitudes, the, the, I would say the feelings of um, responsibility that people in our parish have come to have, feeling guilty, feeling personally guilty for how we got to where we are in this country, for not knowing how we got there and how it persists today, but in a different wrapper and with different labels and in different ways. Uh, and you know, I, Rafa, you mentioned about in India and, and the way you grew up. My 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 parents met in a factory when they were sixteen and seventeen years old and got married when at that age they they left school after eighth grade because they had all the education they needed. But the big difference was they weren't black, and they weren't Hispanic, they weren't Native American. So when they accumulated something, they could go and and buy a house and they could get a mortgage because the FHA would, would uh, guarantee that mortgage. Blacks were prohibited from doing that. Banks would not. So people of, of my generation and even later, as they were coming up, I was blessed because they could build some equity in a house and then my dad could invest it in his little tailor shop. And the tailor shop was enabled us, my brother to become a dentist and me to, to go to college. My, my black friends didn't have that, didn't have those resources because their parents and grandparents were prohibited from building up equity and consequently constantly live week to week, paycheck to paycheck. So I'm being naive and you know, I think about civic engagement, civic, I was involved with Campus Compact for years and years and years being on their board and that was all about civic engagement. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fallen apart. People don't really understand how we got to where we are and what kind of legacy we are carrying with us and how we have to take a role in um, surfacing that legacy and understanding how it's impacting us today. Thank you. I'm if just I may just jump in with a, just a bit of a follow up, I think um, you know many of my friends who who identify as white will come to me and say, "I just feel so guilty," and I encourage them that you should feel urgency. There should not be a sense of guilt for something that your parents' generation did, but there should be a responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, you know, when we talk about um, the the need to uh, look at me, you know, re-examine what reparations are, instead of saying, hey, this is a blank check or a lump sum, sum of money, thinking about, well, there was a, a interest rate that was given to returning soldiers, and that should go to, you know, the heirs of soldiers who served. So being very creative and having a sense of urgency and saying, these are some things we can do. And going back to education, I just, I really want to emphasize um, something that is really, was really important um, in the areas where I serve. People said, oh, well, we really need uh, teachers of color. We really need to hire Black teachers and, and uh, Latinx teachers. And I absolutely, you know, as a department chair, you know, went to look for, for teachers who were role models uh, for, for the students that they were teaching. But I also was frustrated that I, I I also think white students need to see teachers of color and a lot of the more um, just damning uh, scenarios of racial injustice um, have to do with the fact that so many of our young people do not have a positive experience with a person of color. They don't know them. So their experiences are through media, through um, stereotypes and things that are very damaging. Uh, I've asked frequently, have you to, you know, different groups of who has had the privilege of having a teacher of color. And I always, I'm so thankful, you know, upon hearing the responses because it's very far and few in between that I had Miss Davis, who was an incredible, powerful African-American woman who just, you know, in the second grade, uh, she has done more for me than I can ever imagine just being that role model so that any of those stereotypes that came my way Certainly, I'm human, I'm, you know, I'm fallible, but there was something that could challenge that. So if we can look at education, going back to civic education, but also look at those teachers and those role models, if we can really invest in that pipeline of teachers of color, I think we would be addressing many of these, again, just the roots of these challenges that we have. Oh, I think you just, a, uh, oh, I just want to make sure we gave proper, go ahead. Oh, I have just following up on Janet, so I finished uh, high school in a small village as I mentioned, and circumstances forced me to just come here. I came to New York City for college, 
And mind you, I had never seen a white person or a black person before I came to New York City. And uh, one of the fellows who helped me out quite a bit, he was a foreign student advisor or something, was a uh, African American. And he was so good to me. And it's like, oh, you know, I, it took me a long time to realize that there was actually a caste system here. <laughs> so it's, it's the examples that, you, that you, you see over over a period of time. And as, as Janet mentioned, I think we need to have examples on, on both sides. Yeah. What I would say there is that lack of diversity reinforces lack of diversity. So in parallel with building this Black Corporate Board Readiness Program, we've launched a series of conversations on diversity in Silicon Valley. I just put the link in the chat there. There's a conversation tomorrow called Women in Investing, but it's really um, much more about identity and investing um, and intersectional identities and in investing. And I think that the facts are well known. I won't recite them here that we have a huge underrepresentation of people of color on venture capital firm and PE uh, uh, partnerships. We have a huge underrepresentation, as I already mentioned, on public and private boards. There's movement towards changing that with the NASDAQ proposed listing requirements, which are currently under review by the SAC, SEC with California's AB 979 uh, and with BlackRock with Larry Fink coming out and saying we're going to divest. But that only applies to public companies, which are you know, employ only about 25% of people in the United States. So we still have a huge uh, barrier to overcome. And to the work that, that Bernie's doing with um, PhDs in, in the business fields, the same is true in technology and innovation. If we don't have Black people who are role models as scientists and innovators and technologists that get investment, those are not, then people are not going to follow in, the, in those tracks. And to your point, they're also not going to see that as a natural progression for anybody who has those talents. So we need to have diversity in, in all of these systems. Um, to perpetuate diversity. And, and it's going to take programs in education, in venture capital, in corporate governance, in every one of our systems uh, to create change. And I think that's a huge lift for foundations and why I think, you know, you brought this up earlier, Erica. Um, I, I'd really like to see um, foundations leverage a lot more of their assets than the 5% that's required to create change. If not now, if not now, after the first three weeks of this year, when we've gone from insurrection to impeachment, finally inauguration, when I can finally say Happy New Year to people, if not now, when? And if not who, uh, if not us, who? Who's going to do it? And that's part of the reason I've decided to focus on not just social impact, but the business is started by women. Uh, sadly, less, only about 5% of the, the business is started by women get funded. Uh, and and it's, it's a simple solution. Well, first of all, I, I tell everybody, I make a lot more money than, than a lot of other people uh, just investing in, in women. Secondly, I think we need more women investors and investors of, of color so that they can support the, the, the founders. And that's, you know, sadly, that's going to take 10, 20 years, but then we'll have a somewhat equal uh, uh, equality. Well, it's interesting. I, I was going to say, Erica, I just want to make sure, Erica, you share your story because your path is amazing and I, you're the best panel leader, but I, I, I know all of us really want to hear about your path and real and what you're doing and how all these people can be part of that as well. So I don't want to miss that. I appreciate that. And actually, one of the things I was going to mention was this um, work that I've been doing with the Beck Center um, uh, for Social Impact and Innovation. But um, the um, in 2019, this was the statistic like the $69 trillion asset management industry, less than one and a half percent of that is being managed by uh, BIPOC and women owned asset management firms, right? Like, if that is a, a market dislocation that cannot abide, and we cannot continue to see that, um, because that's clearly not um, globally or in the United States what our population looks like. So, how can you even? Um, you know, again, if the networks are already small and closed, you don't even know where the investment opportunities lie if all of the assets are sitting in the hands of predominantly white men, right? So it's like 98% of it. Um, and then that's not what our country looks like, right? Like that's not what where the, the um, opportunities um, uh, are. And so 
you know, a lot of the, the same statements, you know, like, well, we can't find them when it comes to placement, you know, whether it's hiring or a board um, is something that's said often about um, asset managers um, as well, like asset managers of color or, um, or women. And so what is the, the responsibility to actually put pressure on that industry um, that it is actually diversifying, but then also ensuring that assets are going into those firms. There's a, a study um, done by um, uh, Lumen Capital and, and Spark at, at uh, Stanford that looked at the bias that's built into that process that demonstrates that that bias is actually preventing performance because um, the, the uh, Black-owned asset management firms that were actually outperforming were less likely to be selected um, when the decision makers were white. And so you're, you're now actually <laughs> not performing your fiduciary duty um, by um, uh, letting the bias, right? Like Dane, as you were saying, like <laughs> it, it becomes cyclical, right? So um, how do we start to pay attention to and really focus in on um, a lot of these, these processes that, you know, just don't go interrogated. Like it, it just goes unquestioned um, as, as being standard practice. And so um, we have about nine minutes left on the call. And so I would encourage if there are any questions, please, please put them in the chat, drop them in the chat. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what are some of the, um, at least from, from where I sit and a lot of the strategies that, that I've seen um, foundations um, start to, to pick up in this, this space involve, um, again, voice, <laughs> who's, who's accountability, to whom are our decision makers accountable, you know, um, and uh, making sure that we're paying attention to, again, interrogating those things that just kind of flow with, you know, automatically. So I, um, a mentor once said, you know, we don't need bad actors for um, systemic racism to persist. We just need people to do nothing. Um, and it's not that there aren't any out here, there are plenty, but, um, it, it just takes us all to sit back and say, oh, well, we throw up our hands, we can't do anything about it, or, you know, that's just the way that this goes. And so none of this stuff is, is like gravity, right? Gravity is gravity. <laughs> that is an immutable law of nature. Uh, but a lot of this is made up and we can, we can choose to make up something different. So um, in these final moments, you know, if there is a, you know, the, the, that nugget that you want to make sure people walk away <laughs> from this discussion with, please do share it. Um, and then if we have any time, we'll, we'll take some of the questions at the end. So um, Dane, I'll go ahead and start with you. Yeah, so I appreciate what you said, uh, Erica, and, and, and I think it resonates with um, the work of changing governance systems for all organizations, corporate um, boards, um, political systems, uh, foundations too. I think foundations need to be um, more creative in some specific ways. The first that we already talked about is building coalitions that drive systems level change and supporting uh, whether individually as a foundation or in partnership with other foundations, kind of a syndicate, um, all of the key stakeholders um, and, and actors to affect uh, change in, in that system. Um, th the second thing um, which you alluded to and I think is really important is that this is about collective action. It's not about people sitting on the sidelines. We either, we either make the change or, or we don't. So we really need to get everybody on board. Um, and the third part is that, um, and, and some foundations are starting to do this. If you believe in what um, the leader of an organization you're funding is doing, then you should trust them to allocate capital in the way that best advances their mission. In other words, I'm a big advocate of unrestricted operating funds that the CEO or executive director of the organization you're making the contribution to can use to best create the impact that is aligned with their mission. And then the last part is, you know, following the lead of uh, Darren Walker and leveraging assets for change. Interest rates are low now. We're stuck in these capitalist systems. And there is this, you know, real primacy of capitalism as a model to measure value creation, but it's not the only form of value on this planet. I think we're getting more and more conscious and mindful of that. But for now, it is part of it. Use that 95% and put some social bonds into action like Ford Foundation has done. And let's get a lot more capital because I understand if we go at the pace that we've been going with incremental change, it might take 10 or 20 years and that's way too long. People have been waiting 400 years. Thanks. Now, uh, Bernie, let's go to you. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with what Thane has said. And then again, a big believer in collaborations. I think that that foundations ought to figure out uh, where do they want to attack the problem? What, 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 where do they think that they have the credibility 
uh, based on their organization to attack a problem, find the, the very best organizations that are having great success in that area, and then fund them. But in funding them, uh, it always drove me crazy. And I, I, I uh, was perhaps criticized by my foundation board more times than not, in that we said, no, we make contributions, we don't make grants. Because when you make grants, then you're requiring the organization to continue to do all this paperwork and, and report back and use up their capital and their, their human and their financial capital responding to these things. Well, if you pick the organization, you believe in their mission, then fund them. Don't make them jump through hoops and, and all kinds of reporting and putting together the, the RFP or the proposal, uh, which takes all kinds of time and then reporting back and then measuring. That Just measure their mission. You know, me are, is the organization doing what they set out to do and are they having really good results in, in attacking their mission? And if so, forget all this paperwork. You know, have the confidence. Have the, the big C word for me in foundations is have, have the courage to step out of your comfort zone and make a difference with your funding. I was thinking about what has happened in the last four years, last year and last uh, few weeks ago. I like to think that Fear is a powerful, powerful stimuli, but it's a short term. And I like to think that the hope is what's going to bring us out of this mess. Let's leave it at that. The hope is for a long term. Thank you. And Janet, if you want to close this out with your thoughts, the, the, the big takeaway. Yeah, so much pressure. I just, um, <laughs> you know, I just want to say that anyone who offers me a solution as to how to solve the equity problem, I immediately think you're a liar because it's complicated, right? And it's challenging. And if it was easy, someone would have solved it already is one of my mentors would always tell me when I was you know, struggling on how do we, how do we actually get uh, our students out of their circumstances? How do we empower you know, our young people and students of color to, to achieve all the things that they, they can achieve um, outside of those circumstances? I think um, I really it really resonates that if not now then when for foundations it's um, you know I, I I'm sometimes jaw on the ground when you know people are an industry that's worth over seventy five billion dollars in assets is like oh we don't we just don't want to take that risk and I'm thinking well you know a pandemic is once in a century this is probably the time to you know think a little more creatively and be uh, you know open up the checkbook or look at the interest rates etc so those things definitely resonate. Um, I do think the creativity uh, that's lacking that uh, we've called upon, it comes from this conformity culture, as we said, that most people in philanthropy look the same, act the same, have the same, you know, a, they're hoarding these Ivy League credentials, um, but their life experiences are, are very similar. Um, their ideology is very similar. And I think diversity isn't just um, for show, but it allows for dissent. And uh, what democracy is all about is high quality dissent and arguments, better arguments to, uh, to ensure that we have the best ideas. And if we have the same people in the room, we're just not going to get to the, the, the even ask the right questions, let alone get to the solutions um, that we need for these, uh, these unprecedented challenges that have converged on our lifetime all at once. So I just really hope that we can get to a point where we are bringing all types of diversity into not just the boardroom, but really staff at the decision level making and infiltrating through um, through that capacity. And that's, that is my hope for philanthropy and the future of philanthropy. Thank you so much. Um, so I absolutely appreciate all of these voices um, and um, all of the perspectives, these wildly different experiences that have, but I'm still trying to uh, push this boulder up the hill. Um, and, and it's been a pleasure to be in conversation with all of you. I'm reminded of that James Baldwin quote about um, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And I am encouraged that um, we are, this group, and, and those that you touch um, through your work are, are really facing um, these issues head on um, and trying to change them. Um, and that's, that's, that's the courage and, and the action that we've got to, we got to take at this point. So Carol, I will turn it back over to you. And thank, thank you. So much you. For 
Oh, well, thank you, Erica Seth Davies, for making time and space to lead this group and, and their disparate uh, perspectives and um, insights. So it's been great to have you all here. Next month, we'll have um, Oscar Sweeten Lopez, who's from Grad Snap and the Michael Susan Dell Foundation. Um, we'll have Jamie Van Leeuwen, who's um, part of the Global Livingston Institute and also the Emerson Collective. We'll have um, Frank Fernandez from the Atlanta Community Foundation and uh, several other guests on the 24th of February at four o'clock Eastern time. So you can think about it as, you know, the third Wednesday of every month when, you, when you'd like to show up and join um, these equity discussions. So um, we will also have a K-12 session tomorrow at four at, um, actually tomorrow, it's one hour earlier. Um, it's three o'clock Eastern time tomorrow with Dr. Paul Miller and some incredible people who um, are speaking and participating with him. Um, and the panelists are in our newsletter. I think most of you are part of our newsletter. If you're not, email me and we'll make sure that you can be on that list. And I just wanna thank all of you. I know it's such a busy time. People are um, stressed and you know, just uh, so raw. Uh, I just wanna say like uh, tied so um, tightly in so many ways with what everyone's managing right now, personally, professionally, in terms of the country. And uh, just wanna really acknowledge um, all of you for making the time. And I know everyone within the Global Minded community looks forward to working with all of you because we need all of us from all different perspectives, every way you can define diversity politically, you know, culturally, whatever, um, that's how we define it. So we look forward to working with all of you and really uh, defining how we can move those major levers of access and equity with collaborations that we've not seen the last few decades. And um, we know we can, we can really make that happen. So thanks to all of you. And what we will be doing is for those who signed up and those who have been part of the last few sessions, we'll be sharing the link to this so that if you wanna share it with your networks, other people who may be interested, you'll have that. And also in our newsletter are Thane's upcoming sessions. And there is also a session called Philanthropy So White that is in the newsletter as well. So we hope that you'll join or share that with your networks and uh, we'll make sure we get you this tomorrow along with um, Thane or Erica or Preful or Janet or Bernie, any other articles or things you wanna get to us, uh, Celeste and I, we'll send those out with the link. So thanks so much and we look forward to seeing you all next month on the third Wednesday for um, Oscar Sweeten Lopez. It'll be a, a wonderful discussion at that time as well. So thanks to you all.